Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good? All right. Hope you had a good lunch uh, and, and a really good morning. So um, my name is Kai Nguyen. I'm the Portfolio Director for the Healthy Living Area at the Colorado Health Foundation. I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Rob Lustig, here today. Um, but before I do that, just a couple of things, just to remind you that we will hopefully have some time uh, for questions after Rob speaks. So again, note cards on your table. Please uh, fill out your questions and put them to the center or uh, at the end, and we will pick them up. Um, center of the aisle, and we will pick them up uh, uh, during the Q&A and, and try to get through as many questions as we can. So, but please, we would love to have some questions from you. Um, so I just want to share that I first got to know uh, Rob's work after reading an article uh, in the New York Times Magazine in 2011, so uh, four years ago, that was titled Sweet and Vicious. That was very thought-provoking. So I've been following uh, his work uh, for many years now, and so we've been trying to get him to the symposium, so very excited to have him here this year. And I think you will find his remarks very thought-provoking as well. Um, so Rob is a longtime leader in the fight against obesity and diabetes in children and adults, author of the New York Times bestseller, Fat Chance. Rob is a pediatric neuroendocrinologist who's currently investigating the nutritional, neuro, hormonal, and genetic influences of obesity. In 2001, Rob joined the Division of Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco as a professor of pediatrics. Previously, he was on staff at St. Jude Re Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, working with children whose hypothalamus had been damaged by brain tumors or subsequent surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. Because many of these patients became massively obese, he explored the role of fructose as a mediator of both chronic disease and continued caloric, caloric consumption. His research led to the YouTube video, Sugar, the Bitter Truth, which has received more than 3 million hits. And if you've not had a chance, Rob also appeared in the documentary Fed Up that uh, came out last year, I think spring of last year, that again, very interesting, very fascinating uh, on this topic. So, um, and we just heard, I think this morning, that it's nominated for uh, an Emmy. So please welcome me in joining, uh, welcoming Rob Lustig. Thank you, Khan, and thank you, everyone, for uh, inviting me and for being here, uh, for trying to help solve this national dilemma that we've got. I'm doing my best, uh, and I'm going to try to show you uh, why we've got this problem, and hopefully, uh, during the breakout session, what we can potentially do about this problem. Now, I will start out by saying that Colorado has the lowest obesity rates in the country, and it also has the lowest diabetes rates in the country. You are number one out of 50 in both of those, so that's... <laughs> but not for the reason you think. <laughs> in fact, it has to do with cold and altitude, not your wonderful outdoor lifestyle. <laughs> and there's actually biochemistry that supports that. So I just had to get that off my chest. <laughs> and now it can go on from there. Okay. Um, I'm a scientist, okay? and I don't know if any of you have ever uh, uh, delved into the scientific field, but you know, most experiments fail. Nine out of 10 experiments fail, and some of those are you know, hardcore bench or clinical science experiments, and some of those are social experiments as well. Let me give you an example of a social experiment that failed. Here's one right here. And this was just from a month ago in Time Magazine. Okay? And it listed all the reasons why this particular social experiment had failed. So we can invest a lot of effort and angst and national pride into a social experiment and ultimately have it prove a failure. You can't know whether or not an experiment failed until you see the outcomes. The outcomes determine whether the experiment success, was successful or failed. So I'm going to pose to you today that each one of you has now has been, over the past 50 years, been the uh, a participant, an unwitting participant in a research experiment posed by 10 principal investigators all over the world that posed the following hypothesis. Processed food is better than real food. Processed food is better than real food. 
That's the hypothesis. We have to then look at the outcomes to determine whether or not that hypothesis has been fulfilled or whether we should refute it. Everybody with me so far? And so the outcomes that we are going to look at are consumption, health and disease, environment, and cash flow. And cash flow has three parts, companies, consumers, and society. So we're going to take each one of those in turn. So here's the experiment, if you will. 1965, the start of the experiment. Everybody remember Swanson TV dinners? Right? The beginning of the experiment? And spam. <laughs> Oh, actually, it was predated. That was from World War II, but it you know, picked up in 65. And here's what the experiment looks like today. And um, you, you recognize all of these. And of course, there's many more uh, examples. Uh, and here are the 10 principal investigators okay, right here. And, okay, everybody take a quick look in the center there, right? Kraft, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, General Mills, Kellogg's, Mars, Unilever, J&J, &J, p and and Nestle. Okay? So they have basically altered the social environment to pose this experiment. So let's talk about what processed food is. So processed food has a definition. It has to be mass produced so that it's available to everyone. It has to be consistent batch to batch. It has to be consistent country to country so that a McDonald's hamburger in France is the same as a McDonald's hamburger in, uh, you know, in uh, Keystone. Uh, specialized ingredients from specialized companies Virtually all the macronutrients, the protein, the carbohydrate, the fat, has to be pre-frozen, which means that the fiber has to be removed because you can't freeze fiber. And it has to stay emulsified. That is, the fat and the water don't separate, so you have to use emulsifiers to do that. And it has to have very long freezer or shelf life. Everybody with me? That's processed food. So let's talk about now what the difference between processed food and real food is. There are very specific differences, and here they are not enough fiber. And each, with, with each one of these, there's a book that you can uh, access that will teach you about this. Not enough omega-3 fatty acids, which come from wild fish, not farmed fish. Farmed fish is processed food, because farmed fish eat corn. Wild fish eat algae. And the omega-3s are made by the algae, not the fish. Micronutrients of various sorts, which travel with the fiber fraction. And now, too much trans fats, although they are coming down because now the FDA has agreed that these are not generally recognized as safe, and they are now going to be banned. Hooray, but it's been a 50-year battle. Branched-chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, these are amino acids that are found in corn-fed beef, chicken, and fish at high uh, uh, amounts, and your liver turns that into liver fat, which is, you will see is a big problem. Omega-6 fatty acids, which are pro-inflammatory, which you find in various plant and seed oils, such as corn and soybean oil. At various food additives, the list is myriad. It's about 7,000 long. Emulsifiers, polysorbate A, 80, um, uh, carboxymethylcellulose. Carrageenan, carrageenan. Anybody ever heard, heard of carrageenan? So that's the emulsifier used in ice cream. And do you know who brought carrageenan and, uh, to, to ice cream? Margaret Thatcher. She was an ice cream chemist before she was prime minister. <laughs> salt, OK, everybody familiar with salt? <laughs> and every one of these, we have correlative data. Correlative, not causative. So that makes these highly suspect in a public health venue, because in order to talk about fixing a problem, you have to have causation. Well, there's one more that we have on this list that we do have causation for, and here it is, sugar. This we have causation for. And so most of my comments are going to be directed towards sugar, but I want you to understand there's a whole litany of why processed food is different from real food. And we will talk about whether it's better or worse as we go. So the big question, we know about this, right? Addictive and hazardous to your health. Well, is this true? What do you think? Well, National Geographic seems to think so. How about that? Sugar, why we can't resist it? And it's an entire story uh, you know, uh, from Richard Cohen back in August 2013 about the entire sugar trade. The, remember the slave trade, the triangle trade? And why that became the single biggest commodity on the planet until oil supplanted it in 1940. So now it's the second biggest commodity on the planet. OK. So the question is, why? Well, the answer is because we love it. That's why. This is from the Netherlands. This is from the chief medical officer of the Netherlands, Paul van der Velpen. 
Sugar is addictive and the most dangerous drug of the times. Now this is coming from a guy who lives in the Netherlands and they know something about addictive drugs there. <laughs> well, in fact, we know it too. Anybody know what this is? You do. What is it? It's that's right. This is called Sweeties. Sweeties. This is a super concentrated sucrose solution that you dip the pacifier in and then you stick it in the newborn boy's mouth when you do the circumcision because it releases opioids in the brain in order to be your natural painkiller. Okay, and sugar is a natural painkiller until it is a natural pain inducer. So of the 600,000 items in the American food supply, 74% of them have added sugar. And we're talking about all the foods, okay? But only 50% of them have greater than their, the recommended amount of added salt. So that means that sugar is the marker for processed food. And sugar is in virtually all processed food. And the reason is because sugar makes all the other bad tastes go away. It makes sour go away like lemonade and uh, the Swiss Reserve in German wine. It makes bitter go away, like milk chocolate, because caffeine is bitter. It makes umami go away, like, for instance, sweet and sour pork. And it makes salty go away, like honey roasted peanuts or Chex Mix. Okay? Basically, you can make dog poop taste good with enough sugar. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> so, now let's do the outcomes. Consumption. So. Everyone will say, well, of course, we're eating more. I know we're eating more, and indeed we are. So 1957 over there is the White Castle original hamburger, 210 calories. In the middle there's Bob's Big Boy at 618 calories. And in the midst of the obesity epidemic, Hardee's had the temerity to offer us the Thick Burger at 1,420 calories. And of course, Carl's Jr. has the $6 burger, 2,000 calories. That's the entire allotment for the entire day, right? Okay. So indeed, we are all eating more adults. Um, adult men are eating 187 calories more than before, 337 for adult women, 275 in this slide for teen boys. So what is it we're eating more of? Are we eating more of everything? No. We're eating more fat? No. We're actually eating the same amount of fat. So 45 grams, 45 calories. So if you look at the secular trends in specific food intake, here are the fats. So whole milk way down, meat and cheese up slightly, me, uh, uh, milk desserts up a little bit, but bottom line, it's a wash. And that's what the data say, it's a wash. Now, our percent of calories from fat has gone down, although our absolute consumption has not. So we've gone from 40 to 30% because the USDA back in 1977 said we needed to reduce our consumption of saturated fat. Everybody knows about that now. And that's actually the biggest debacle on the planet in terms of science. You want to talk about Bad science, that was bad science, okay? And in the midst of all of this, the obesity epidemic has just taken off. So what are we eating more of? Well, it's carbohydrate, okay? 228 calories out of that 275. And here's the carbohydrate here in red, and you can see all of them up through the roof. That's what we're eating more of, because carbohydrate was the bottom of the food pyramid, remember? All those grains, right? Because those are the cheapest thing to produce, that's why. So, and in particular, beverages, right? 41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids. And what is this stuff? Well, in America, it's this thing called high fructose corn syrup, right? 63 pounds per person per year. But just remember that the only users of high fructose corn syrup are the US, Canada, Japan, with very, very limited exposure in parts of Europe. Yet, the entire world is suffering from these same chronic metabolic diseases. Everyone's got it, okay? Australia's got it, they don't have high fructose corn syrup. Korea's got it, they don't have high fructose corn syrup. China's got it, they don't have high fructose corn syrup. India's got it, they don't have high fructose corn syrup. Because high fructose corn syrup's just a cheap form of sugar. High fructose corn syrup's evil because it made sugar cheap. It was a competition. Now we prop it up with subsidies and tariffs, but the fact is, it doesn't matter. It's not the vehicle that matters, it's the payload. And you'll see why. And this is the payload right here. So here's high fructose corn syrup on top. One glucose on the left, six-membered ring, 
Glucose is the energy of life. Everybody on the planet has to, uh, burns glucose for energy. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. But this other one over here, this one on the right, called fructose, notice five-membered ring? Only the liver can metabolize fructose. And the problem is that when fructose is supplied in excess, which is very easy to do because the liver has a limited capacity to be able to metabolize it, when you supply it in excess, the liver has no choice but to take that extra and turn it into liver fat. And we now know that that liver fat is the driver of all of these chronic metabolic diseases that we're talking about. So that's where it comes from. Now, sucrose down below, you can see one glucose, one fructose, joined by this O-glycosidic linkage. Big deal. Who cares? The enzyme in your intestine sucrase cleaves this in a nanosecond. You liberate the two molecules. You absorb them just the same. So it doesn't matter that it's high fructose corn syrup or sucrose. It's sugar any which way you look at it. And of course, we have a lot of it. And it's been going up and up and up and up. So I call this slide very specifically the Coca-Cola conspiracy, and you'll see why in a minute. In 1915, that was the original standardized bottle out of Atlanta, six and a half ounces. And if you drank one of those every day for a year, that would be worth eight pounds of fat per year in terms of calories. Not in terms of disease, but in terms of calories. In 1955, after sugar became plentiful after World War II, we got the 10 ounces, first ones found in vending machines. Then 1960, the 12 ounce can still with us, that's 16 pounds of fat per year. And currently, of course, on the right is the single unit of measure, right? At 20 ounces, that's the only one you can find now. That's two and a half, eight ounce servings. Anybody know anybody who gets two and a half, eight ounce servings out of that? That's a single serving, right? And then finally, we got the 44 ounce Big K, Thirst Buster, Big Gulp, 7-Eleven, whatever. 44 ounces, and down in Texas, they got a 60-ounce Coca-Cola with, with a Snickers bar and a bag of Doritos, all for 99 cents. A Texas-sized big gulp. So why do I call it the Coca-Cola conspiracy? Well, number one, we talked about how sugar is addictive, right? But what else is in Coke? Caffeine. So what, what is caffeine? Caffeine's a diuretic, makes you pee free water. What else is in Coke? Salt. It's 55 milligrams per can. So what happens if you take on salt and lose free water? You get thirstier. So why is there so much sugar in Coke? To hide the salt, right? OK. So here's what our sugar consumption has done over the past 200 years. The food industry likes the last 30 years. Well, this is the 200 years. Four pounds per year getting fruits and vegetables out of the ground with the occasional honey, all the way up to 100 pounds per year. Right now we're at 90. Okay. And there's processed food in 1965, and you can see what happened. All right, everybody with me? I'm going to show you this slide again later. You'll see why. All right, so that's consumption. Consumption's up. Now let's do health and disease. So here's what's happened to our health parameters. This is from the New England Journal. Smoking, down. Systolic blood pressure, down. Cholesterol, down. Physical activity, up. All good. We should be reaping a health benefit, shouldn't we? But we're not. In fact, we've got a health deficit. Why? Because obesity is up and diabetes is through the friggin' roof. 44% increase. That's why. And that's chewing through all the health care resources. And it's also bankrupting Social Security. Because when you become diabetic, you go on disability. And you need healthy young people to pay into Social Security so that the sick old people can take out. And if the healthy young people are taken out early, then you don't have the money for the sick old people. And so Social Security is experiencing a crisis the world over because of this, because of chronic metabolic disease. Here's the problem. This is from Coca-Cola. This was their Coming Together campaign of 2013. You probably saw it on football games. They had a two-minute video. Beating obesity will take action by all of us based on one simple common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. So you can get your calories from carrots, or you can get your calories from cheesecake, or you can get your calories from Coca-Cola, or you can get your calories from kumquats. Doesn't matter. Because a calorie is a calorie. If you eat more than you burn, you gain weight. If you eat less than you burn, you lose weight. A calorie is a calorie. Therefore, it's energy balance 
eat less, exercise more, diet and exercise. If you're fat, it's your fault. Why pick on our calories? Go pick on somebody else's calories. This is their subterfuge. This is how they deflect criticism. And they say it's common sense. Well, I don't believe in common sense. I believe in science. I believe in data. I'm a scientist. Because the science says something else completely. What the science says is that some calories cause disease more than others because different calories are metabolized differently because a calorie is not a calorie. It's called nutritional biochemistry. And I knew this back in 1975. And then I went to medical school and they beat it out of me. And for the next 35 years, I practiced the calories a calorie and I didn't make anybody healthier. And then I did the research and started realizing, oh my God, I knew this 35 years ago. And then maybe that's why I'm so passionate about it is because this information has been suppressed over the past 50 years that a calorie is not a calorie. Let's show you that a calorie is not a calorie. So you have to basically hold calories constant and show that specific foods still have specific effects unrelated to calories and unrelated to obesity. Here's an example. This is heart disease death over the last two decades based on percent of calories in the diet as added sugar. So percent of calories, so taking into account total calories, right? And taking into account obesity too. So here's the histogram, and the histogram has a median at 18% for the whole US population. 18% of our calories come from added sugar. And that red line in the center is heart disease death hazard risk ratio. And the inflection point's at 15%. Median, 18%, inflection point, 15%. What does that mean? That means that more than half the US population has an increased risk of heart disease death due to their added sugar consumption. And if you're out here on the tail end, on the right side, 30 to 32%, which is where our kids are, our teenagers are, that's their hazard risk ratio for heart disease death is four, four-fold greater. Unrelated to calories and unrelated to obesity. This is a study from Europe called the Epic Interact Study, where they factored out total energy, EI, and factored out obesity, BMI, and asked the question, do sugared sweetened beverages increase risk for diabetes? And the answer is, over a de two decades, yes, by 29%. Each sugar sweetened beverage consumed per day increases your risk for diabetes by 29%. And in America, we're not drinking one sugar beverage a day, we're drinking two and a half. So take that up to 68%. This is our study that we published two years ago, where we looked at the Food and Agriculture Organization Statistics Database, and we looked at line items of different foods and foodstuffs over a decade, country by country, and asked the question, what predicted diabetes, in, increase in diabetes prevalence? And the answer, only sugar, not total calories. Total calories was irrelevant. For every extra 150 calories any country ate, diabetes prevalence went up a total of 0.1%. Nothing, nada. But if those 150 calories happened to be a can of soda instead, diabetes prevalence went up 11 fold, 11 fold for every 150 calories as sugar, 1.1%. These data actually meet causation. They meet the Bradford Hill criteria for causal medical inference because we show dose, more sugar, more diabetes. We show duration, longer sugar exposure, more diabetes. We show directionality. Countries where sugar went up, more diabetes. Countries where sugar went down, and there were a few, less diabetes. And most importantly for causation, you have to show precedence. You have to show that the cause precedes the effect, right? And that's the problem with correlation studies, is it's a snapshot in time. You don't know about reverse causality, but here we had causality because we showed three years. Three years. Whenever sugar changed, diabetes changed in the same direction three years later. And we took out obesity and we took out total calories. And we estimate that 25% of all the diabetes on the planet is due to sugar and sugar alone. We have now done an interventional study that even supports this even more so. And this is now under review at a major journal. We've sh shown it in abstract form. What we did is we took 43 kids with metabolic syndrome and we, uh, 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 we catered their meals for 10 days. No added sugar but same number of calories, same amount of carbohydrates, same amount of protein, same amount of fat. 
We just took the chicken teriyaki out, put the turkey hot dogs in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, put the baked potato chips in. We took the pastries out, and we put the bagels in. Okay? No change in weight, no change in calories, 10 days. We studied them before and after. And here's what happened. Sub-Q fat, so big butt fat, no change because no change in weight. But visceral fat, the bad fat, the belly fat that everybody talks about, down 10%. And most importantly, liver fat, down 29% in 10 days. And the liver fat is the cause of all those chronic metabolic diseases. Pancreatic fat. You're not supposed to have fat in your pancreas. These kids did, and three quarters of them, the pancreatic fat went down too. On the same number of calories. If a calorie were a calorie, how could it do this? It's because a calorie is not a calorie. So we have causation for sugar and diabetes, sugar and heart disease, sugar and fatty liver disease, and also sugar and tooth decay. Now, I know that Wayne Hornsby is in this room and asked me very specifically to talk about this because the dental foundation, Delta Dental, is very interested in this issue. Everybody thinks that fluoride fixes tooth decay. <laughs> Garbage. It's not true, okay? Fluoride makes you think that it fixes tooth decay. This is not true. Diet fixes tooth decay. And sugar causes tooth decay. And sugar is the biggest problem in children of all. It's the greatest number of anesthesias. It's the greatest number of admissions to the hospital. And it is the greatest contributor to chronic pain worldwide, bar none, or anything. Okay? And we also have correlation for cancer and dementia, but not causation yet. We're working on that. All right, let's do environment real quick. So the question is, does sugar harm the environment? And the answer is, oh, yeah. Soil erosion, water generation, wind generation, loss at harvest, you bet. Here's the Everglades, OK? There's Lake Okeechobee there in the upper left. Wherever you see orange, yellow, and light green, that's sugar, not Everglades. They've taken over. And the phosphate runoff is killing the Everglades. And this is true in the Amazon as well. And so we are actually losing ground in terms of our environment. And this is, of course, contributing to global warming as well. Now, cash flow, the big one. Let's start with companies. So here's what's happened to our food. 1982, 2012. Meats, down 10% because we're all told to go low fat. Fruits and vegetables, exactly the same. Now, we're always told we don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. And that's true. We don't. But we never did. And we didn't have this problem in 1982, but we have it now on the same number of fruits and vegetables. Why is that? Because that's not the problem. Everybody thinks fruits and vegetables. I'm not against fruits and vegetables. I'm for them because I'm for fiber. OK? But if you think fruits and vegetables, by offering those, like this 5210 crap, is going to solve this problem, you got another thing coming. Grains and baked goods up a percent. And that's a problem because grains and baked goods is glucose, and glucose means insulin, and insulin means weight gain. And so that's part of the obesity equation. No argument there. Dairy products, down 2.5%, because now we're all lactose intolerant. Here's the big one in yellow. Processed foods and sweets, 11.6%, 22.9%, a doubling in the span of 30 years. This is what has happened to our food over this processed food debacle, this 50-year experiment. Now, let's talk about the companies. So here's the S&P 500 in blue from 2007 to 2011. And here's the stock price for McDonald's, Coke, and Pepsi. And there's the economic downturn of 2008 right over there. And you can see they weathered the storm very nicely, thank you. Okay? And here's Hormel, ADM, General Mills, ConAgra, Procter & Gamble, and Kraft against the S&P 500. Want to make money? Invest in a food company, right? Because they're all doing better than the S&P, but not so. Because now we know what's going on. And over the last two years, things have changed. Things have changed for the food companies. So here's big sugar. Here's Tate and Lyle, Olovo, and Sudzucker against the S&P. And all of a sudden, not doing so hot anymore. 
And here's Dr. Pepper Snapple, Pepsi, Coke, and McDonald's against the S&P for the last two years. And you know that McDonald's fired its CEO, right? And you know that Coke fired 1,800 employees to save $3 billion. And do you know what they plan on doing with those $3 billion? Investing in children's marketing. You okay with that? So now let's talk about consumers. So here's what the price of food at the consumer level has done. Okay? Take a look at the right side, which is better than the left side here. So there's healthier food in green and less healthy food in red. And you'll notice that less healthy food has always been cheaper than healthy food. We know that. But take a look at the slope of the line. So over that decade, healthy food in the UK has gone up by 7 pence per pound. Less healthy food, sorry. Whereas healthy food has gone up by 17 pence per pound. In other words, not only is healthy food more expensive, but it's getting more expensive with time, which of course is why everybody opts for less healthy or processed food. And that's true worldwide, because you can see here, we're looking now at the percent of gross domestic product spent as food, country by country. And here's the US at 7%, and there's the UK at 9%, and there's Australia at 11%, and we are the three most obese countries. Take a look at all the countries that are in purple. They spend more than 36% of their GDP on food, and all of them have been in revolution in the last three years. And that's on purpose, because if your food is expensive, you're mad. Okay? That's what happens. So in its essence, you know, Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the people. Yeah, but Karl Marx never met McDonald's. So the question is, well, you'd say that processed food, therefore, is a good deal for consumers. But you would be wrong. Because here now, we're looking at the projections for US healthcare costs over the course of the next couple of years. And there's hospital, there's physician, and there's pharma. And they do not add up to the total healthcare costs because the rest of it's going to chronic metabolic disease, which each person is footing the bill. And they're footing it in, the, uh, in their insurance premiums. So when you actually look at how much money you save on food, it is more, more than evened out by the amount of money you spend on health care insurance. And when you finally do get sick, which of course 50% of our population does at a younger age, you are going to be spending a whole lot more because of food-related chronic metabolic disease. So this is not a good deal. Now let's do society. Remember this slide? Remember processed food? There it is, 1965. I'm going to overlay on this graph now the percent of GDP spent on health care in the United States during this same period of time. Everybody ready? What do you see? Processed food entered and health care costs skyrocketed. Now that's temporal relation but we actually have the data that shows that this is why healthcare costs skyrocketed. Because it didn't skyrocket for infectious disease, it skyrocketed for chronic metabolic disease. This is what is chewing through all the healthcare costs. This is not good for the healthcare establishment. This is not good for the Colorado Health Foundation. So let's do the math. The food industry grosses $1 trillion a year of which 450 billion is gross profit. Yet, healthcare costs in the United States total $2.7 trillion a year. And of that, 75% is chronic metabolic disease, and of that, 75% of it is preventable. So when you do the math, 75% of 75% of 2.7, that's $1.4 trillion going down a friggin' rat hole every single year. You want to know why everybody's broke? You want to know why Medicare is going broke? You want to know why Social Security is going broke? This is why. This is not recoupable money unless we fix the chronic metabolic disease problem. Worse yet, we spend triple what the food industry makes. So this is not a zero-sum game. This is a negative-sum game. There's more money going out than they're taking in. This is unsustainable. And this is why Medicare is going broke. And we will not be able to fix this problem until we fix chronic metabolic disease. And we cannot fix 
chronic metabolic disease until we fix processed food. And in order to fix processed food, we have to fix sugar. I'm not the only one who says this. This is a uh, report, 46-page report, from the international investment bank Credit Suisse, okay? Sugar consumption at a crossroads from two years ago. And here's what they say. We believe higher taxation on sugary food and drinks would be the best option to reduce sugar intake and help fund the fast-growing health care costs associated with type 2 diabetes and obesity. This is a global investment bank, people! And they're calling for taxation. Who'd ever heard of such a thing? A bank calling for taxation? Are you kidding me? And this is Morgan Stanley from this year. So they're looking now in green at the uh, rate of economic productivity and growth for the OECD countries, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, the 37 most advanced countries in the world over the next 20 years. That's that green line. And the blue line is if we got rid of sugar, and the yellow line is if we keep it where it is today. And if we keep it where it is today, you can see that that economic productivity percentage goes to zero. So Morgan Stanley called this the bittersweet aftertaste of sugar. So if Morgan Stanley and Credit Suisse get it, why don't you? Well, guess who else gets it? How about this? Mars. Mars Company, the Candy Company, the Milky Way Company, the Snickers Company, the M&M's Company, they get it. They announced on May 8th, and this is a direct quote from their letter to Secretary Vilsack at the USDA. Mars supports the DGAX recommendation that consumers reduce their added sugar intake to no more than 10% of daily energy intake. Furthermore, Mars supports labeling and education approaches, including added sugars and off-label nutrition education at Mars. We believe it is time for all stakeholders, including industry, to engage in a constructive discussion that focuses on effective approaches to helping consumers manage their intake of added sugars. A candy company gets it, but they're the only ones. Why do they get it and nobody else does? Because they are privately held. They don't have to make Wall Street quarterly reports. They don't, have to, they don't have stockholders. They don't have to satisfy their three-month quarterly earnings. They can take the long view, and they get it. The rest of the uh, food industry is fighting this tooth and nail. And in the intervention section, when we're going to talk later, we will tell you why. So let's do the scorecard. Imagine the last 50 years was an experiment. Processed food is better than real food. That's the hypothesis. So what do we know? Consumption. Way up, you bet. How about health? Disaster. In fact, if this had been an institutional review board protocol at a hospital, it would have been stopped decades ago because of the increase in deaths. Environment, clearly negative. And finally, cash flow. Companies, very good previously, but not so good lately. Consumers. Good in the short term because processed food is cheaper, but really bad in the long term because of the chronic metabolic disease it causes. And finally, to society, mega death. Total disaster. Only one answer, real food. This is an experiment that failed. Processed food is an experiment that failed. Nine out of every 10 experiments fail. And the food industry needs to get the message. So what are we going to do? Well, at UCSF, we're going to do what we can. We've instituted the Healthy Beverage Initiative, a hospital. Because remember, hospitals are where smoking stopped, right? Hospitals led the charge in terms of cessation of smoking. We didn't allow smoking in hospitals. Well, there are no more sugar-sweetened beverages on the UCSF campus. Any hospital can do this with the right political will. Proposal number two, let's rename type 2 diabetes because no one knows what the hell it is. <laughs> Okay? I swear to God, no one knows what the hell it is. Let's call it what it is, processed food disease. That's what it is. Pro proposal number three, let's roll back the subsidies for processed food. Grover Norquist. <laughs> Grover Norquist and I have a lot 
uh, to be uh, uh, angry uh, at each other about. Okay, but this is one thing we actually agree on. Proposal number four, a label, a, a stamp right on the front of the package that says real food approved. That is, if you buy this product, ain't nothing dangerous in it. This is real food so that people can actually know. And lastly, what I think is the big one, we got trans fats off the FDA's grass list. It took 25 years. Sugar is not a food. Sugar is not nutrition. It's good, it's fun, it's, life, it's, 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 it's pleasant, but it's not nutrition. Can anybody name me an energy source that is not nutrition, that there's no biochemical reaction in the body that requires it, and that when consumed in excess, it's a toxin, but we love it a lot? Alcohol. Alcohol is not a food. Alcohol is not nutrition, right? Well, sugar and alcohol are identical. And sugar causes the same diseases as alcohol without the alcohol because of the way it's metabolized in the liver, because of that liver fat that we talked about. Sugar is the alcohol of the child. And sugar should not be on the grass list for that reason, because it's causing disease. And that is one of the things that my nonprofit is dedicated to, uh, to uh, seeing through. For more information, you want the science, this is a website that you can access called sugarscience.org that uh, UCSF, the University of California Davis, and Emory University uh, have uh, uh, vetted 8,000 clinical research articles and distilled it down into five messages for the general public without politics, just the science. Fed Up, which uh, Khan mentioned before, which tells us how we got here to where we are today. A new documentary that hasn't reached America yet, uh, the US distributor is planning uh, an October uh, uh, release here called Sugar Coated, which tells us why we got to where we are today. You put the two together, Fed Up and Sugar Coated, and it's an unbeatable combination. So I recommend this all to you when it comes out. Fat Chance and a cookbook that basically, because 33% of Americans do not know how to cook, and you cannot solve this until they do, because if you don't know how to cook, you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of your life. Sweet Revenge, a public television video that is played around the country, has had more than 400 uh, 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 viewings over the course of the last couple of months that explains all of this, and it is now being translated into Spanish. And finally, our nonprofit called the Institute for Responsible Nutrition, because we're taking on big food. We're going to fix this problem in the ways that we can as a nonprofit. The question is, what can government, what can society, what can you do to help foster this new war, if you will? We've had several wars. We had a war against tobacco. Well, now we've got the war against big food. And they're very similar. And we will talk about the interventions and how they work later on. With that, I want to close. And I'll be happy to take all of your questions, and I thank you all for your attention. That was great. Thank you, Rob. And um, please, I have a few questions to start, but if you could. Oh, by the way, before we do, anybody pick up the Summit Daily today? OK, this is from today, J July 30th, page 12. Simplifying sugars, the good and the bad. I mean, it's even coming up here. I mean, you know, this is like amazing. Everybody's getting into the act. Yes, yeah, so please get your questions to the center and uh, we'll pick them up. But I'll, I'll start with a few here that, uh, that I have. So uh, you have some great proposals up there, but you know, and I know you see patients, but what can parents do? You know, many of us work with underserved parents, parents who don't have a lot of resources. What can they do on a daily okay. basis? So we deal with patients like this in clinic every single day. This is what I do for a living. You know, I run the weight assessment for teen and child health clinic at UCSF. If you concentrate on calories, you cannot win. It's not possible to win. And that's what virtually all medical establishments are teaching parents at this point. We undo that. We teach them otherwise. We actually teach them about disease. We actually teach them about what's going on. We don't make it about calories. 
we make it about the biochemistry. We teach them about the biochemistry. Now, I don't expect all of you to go out and teach people about biochemistry, although that's what Sweet Revenge does, actually. What we do is we explain the difference between processed food and real food. And our dietitian runs a teaching breakfast for all new patients. And I'll tell you, the teaching breakfast is the single most important thing we do in order to be able to educate our parents and our patients as to what's going on. So they come fasting, so we draw their blood, and then we sit, you know, they see the doctor, and then we sit them down to a communal breakfast because they're hungry, right? So we have six kids and six parents sitting at a communal table, and it's narrated by a dietitian for an hour, and we explain why these different things are on the buffet on the table. And four things have to come out of that teaching breakfast. Number one, the parent has to see the kid eat the food. Number two, the parent has to see the parent eat the food. Number three, the parent has to see that other kids will eat the food because they got other kids at home. And number four, most importantly, the parent has to see that they can afford the food. Because if any one of those things don't happen, they will not spend money at the store to change what's in their pantry. So you have to accomplish every single one of those. But we do. And then people get it. People understand what's going on. And then they will spend their hard-earned dollars at the store to buy appropriate uh, uh, foodstuffs rather than processed foodstuffs. And that's when we start seeing changes and we start seeing metabolic disease go away. But it takes that level of commitment, and that's what we do. So is there a way to do that without a teaching breakfast, without showing, you know, without, you know, actually, you know, by telling them and not showing them? Yeah, we do that too. Uh, but the point is you have to have one message. You have to make it the message very clear. And people don't know what real food is. Not anymore. They forgot or they never got exposed to it. And kids never got exposed to it, and they need to be. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, and I'm gonna follow up. I know we have some more questions here. Um, but just as a follow-up to that, you, you're, you present very compelling evidence that you know, sugar and processed food um, are, are incredibly bad for us, and I think we all get that. But you, there's no mention of physical activity in here, and we know there are health benefits to physical activity. Oh, there are, physical activity is the single best thing you can do for yourself, without question. Physical activity is the top thing that you can do. No ifs, ands, or buts. But physical activity does not cause weight loss. This is a myth. Physical activity does not cause weight loss. Now, if you believe a calorie is a calorie, then physical activity should cause weight loss, right? Because if you're burning, you ought to be losing weight, except you don't. Why not? Because you're building muscle, and muscle, muscle weighs more than fat. So what happens is their visceral fat goes down and their muscle goes up. And so if they're watching the scale, they may actually gain weight. And then they say, oh, woe is me. It's not working for me. And then they hit the Ben and Jerry's. The point is the outcome variable that you have given them to monitor is the wrong one. Physical activity is beneficial for physical activity's sake because of its health benefit, not because of its weight loss potential. And people need to understand that in order to get them motivated to do it. So that's really, really important. And you know, people don't ask, why, why is, so why, does, uh, why is that good? Because muscles have mitochondria. Mitochondria burn energy instead of your liver, then storing it. Okay? So anything that ups your mitochondria is good. Like, for instance, cold ups your mitochondria. Altitude ups your mitochondria. This is why Colorado is less obese. This is why Colorado has less diabetes, because you guys out here have more mitochondria than I do. So I think we should all move to Colorado. <laughs> It'll increase your tax base. But short of that, and by the way, with global warming, all the people from the coast will be here really soon. So, so I, I, I recommend, uh, you know, Colorado to everybody, but not because of your outdoor lifestyle. That is a sham, okay? It's because you're cold and you're high. Wow. And now you're high this way, too. Oh, my. That's a whole nother session. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, it, uh, I've been reading up a lot on um, 
reviews of your book and, and uh, other talks that you've had. And I think the scientific community has certainly, I think, criticized you for your approach. And so the question is, uh, is the scientific field unified in this um, conclusion of sugar that you've come to? Of course not. <laughs> when is the scientific community ever uh, uh, or, you know, uh, conclusive on anything? The, the point is that there are a lot of people who've made a lot of money and made their entire careers steeped in the concept of a calorie is a calorie. Okay? I mean, let me just tell you a quick, quick vignette. Anybody heard of Marion Nestle? Mm -hmm. yes. Anybody know Marion Nestle? She's one of the food politics people. She runs a blog called Food Politics. She um, has written many, many books on the subject. She is an uh, 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 an RD and an MPH and a PhD in molecular biology of all things, and she is the head of nutrition department at NYU. So I know Marion for a long time, and I asked Marion if she would write a blurb for my book. And Marion, I, I sent the galleys to her, and she says, "Rob, I can't write a uh, a blurb for your book." And I said, "Well, okay. I mean, I understand, but like, why not?" She says, because I just wrote a book called Why Calories Count. <laughs> and my agent tells me that I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I did. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are vested in this old notion. And it takes a long time to turn an aircraft carrier around. And the, this is not something that's going to happen simply or uh, quietly. Uh, this is going to be, you know, this is, the, this is the war. The other thing you have to do, though, when you look at when scientists are talking about this and they're on the other side, you have to see who's um, funding them, okay? And you really need, this is very important. For instance, let me give you an example. There was a paper that came out in Plus Med back in 2013 where they looked at a, a meta-analysis of all of the studies of sugar-sweetened beverages and weight gain. And there were 18 data points, 18 studies of sugar-sweetened beverages and weight gain. And what they did was they sorted them based on industry funding. So of the six that were industry funded, five said no effects of sugar beverages on weight gain. Of the 12 without industry funding, 10 of the 12 said yes, significant effect of sugar-sweetened beverages on weight gain. So from now on, when you read a scientific study, I want you all to put, raise your right hand in the air and take an oath with me. Okay. From now on, when I look at a scientific study, instead of looking at the results or the conclusions first, I will look at the funding source. Great. Now, we've got a lot of questions here, so we'll try to get through them. Um, this is, uh, I think, a really appropriate question for this audience. You mentioned that you know, one of the proposals is eat real food. I think no one would argue with that. But yeah, that's the funny part is, like, who would argue with that? But people are. <laughs> Well, and I think for those of us who, who work with and engage with underserved communities, it is more expensive. So the question is, how does a community change the message that real food is too expensive for poor communities? I mean, right. So the fact is it doesn't have to be more expensive. There are things you can do. There are shopping tips and there are cooking tips that can actually make real food cheaper if you you know, choose to go that route. In the Fat Chance Cookbook, which is the companion uh, uh, book to Fat Chance, uh, my colleague Cindy Gershon, who is a chef and an entrepreneur, actually has a set of uh, precepts that people can use in terms of what they can freeze, what they can put aside, what they can use for other things that ultimately make going to the store a lot easier, making food a lot cheaper, and you know, basically showing where the substitutions can occur that can actually bring costs down. So yes, you have to shop smart. Okay? You can't just shop. You have to shop smart. But we could be teaching those things to people, and that could be helping them do that. They have to want to, and they have to understand the value of doing so. Right now, they don't understand the value of doing so. So you got to teach them that first. Great. I think we have time for one more question. So I, got, I have three here that I think can uh, be lumped together. So um, first part of this question is, is sugar dangerous in all forms, corn syrup, fructose, sucrose? And then is Honey, the agave, maple syrup, doesn't matter. Okay, if it's a caloric sweetener, it's got fructose in it because that's what makes it sweet. So the answer is, it doesn't matter. So second part is, are, all, are sugar substitutes any better than sugar? Everybody wants to know, me too. Everybody wants to know about sugar substitutes. Everybody see the New York Times opinion article by Dr. Aaron Carroll just this past Monday, okay, that said, oh, artificial sweeteners are better than sugar. 
That doesn't mean artificial sweeteners are good. And Yahoo Health had a piece on Tuesday countering that, which I'm quoted in, so look for it, that basically says, Dr. Carroll doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> Here's the problem with artificial sweeteners. There are three, and I'll try to do it quick. There's something called pharmacokinetics. There's something called pharmacodynamics. They're not the same. Pharmacokinetics is what your body does to a drug. Pharmacodynamics is what a drug does to your body. They're not the same. We have all the pharmacokinetics for all the diet sweeteners because the FDA demands it. But we have none of the pharmacodynamics because the FDA does not demand it. Pharmacodynamics tells you about chronic toxicity. The food industry says, well, if the FDA is not asking for it, we're not going to do it. And the NIH says, food industry is compound, food industry is profit, we're not going to pay for it. So, no data. Number two, you put something sweet on the tongue. Message goes, tongue to brain, sugar bolus is coming, get ready to release the insulin. Message goes from the brain to the pancreas, get ready to release the insulin vesicles on my command, line them up and get them ready to go. But then the sugar bolus never comes because it was a diet sweetener. What does the pancreas do? Does it hold on to them or does it go find some calories to go work on? The data suggests the latter in which case then you would overeat in response to a diet sweetener. That's what the data suggests, although it's not proven. Lastly, paper came out last year in Science that said that uh, sh uh, artificial sweeteners, uh, aspartame and sucralose, change the intestinal microbiome, the bacteria in your intestine that uh, are normally Im important for chronic metabolic health, uh, you know, for metabolic health, and turn them to a different uh, species that ends up causing metabolic dysfunction and causing leaky gut and causing glucose intolerance. Now that is only in animals. We have yet to show it in humans. The other thing that was, just came out is emulsifiers. Emulsifiers are detergents, right? The carrageenan I mentioned. They're detergents because they keep fat and water together. So what happens if you throw a detergent into your small intestine? It chews up the mucin layer on the surface of the intestinal epithelial cells so that bacteria can get to those cells because that was the barrier that protected them. And so that might be the cause of various chronic GI complaints and autoimmune diseases. That's yet to be proven too, but it's very enticing. Bottom line, processed food is a problem and artificial sweeteners are processed food. That's great. Well, we could keep going, but we do have a hard stop. Um, so please help me thanking uh, Rob Lustig for his presentation. Thank you. And before you go, just a couple of things. Um, if you want to hear more from Rob, and uh, we have a uh, discovery session on sugar sweetened beverage tax, uh, debating that, please join us. And we have a whole host of other great discovery sessions for you um, to, to choose from. And then just a reminder that tonight we have our dinner reception uh, that will have the announcement of the Eichelhart Award. So please join us for that. So again, thank you very much. And we're going to start the sessions at 1.30 sharp. That's great. You did great. Is that okay? Yes.